So let's start by introducing our Attorney General candidate, John Adams. Chuck Smith is running a little late, he'll be here in a little while. Uh, our candidate for Lieutenant Governor, uh, Bryce Reeves. <laughs> candidate for Governor, Ed Gillespie. Yeah! Candidate for governor, and uh, he's going to have some trouble walking on the stage because he hurt his knee. Denver Riggleman. Yeah! Another one of our great candidates for governor, Senator Frank Wagner. And our fourth candidate for governor, the chairman of the Prince William County Board of Supervisors, Corey Stewart. A seat, we'll get started. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out on a beautiful day and spending some time with us. Um, what John just identified, which is blatant lawlessness by people in, an, in the role of attorney general, is exactly why I am running for office. That's why I'm doing it. When Mark Herring decides which laws we the people pass, we pass, we get to govern ourselves the way we see fit. Men and women have died so we can govern ourselves. But when he appoints himself king and decides which laws he agrees with and which laws he doesn't, and then refuses to defend or even attacks our laws, it undermines our very form of self-government. That is exactly why I'm running for attorney general, because you, the people, we, the people, decide the laws. The role of the attorney general is to be a faithful and loyal servant to the people and to enforce the laws that you pass. We saw this with Sally Rickley Yates. You mentioned it. Donald Trump was right to fire her immediately. If she disagreed with a law that the president passed, her only option was to resign. But to make a political grandstand out of it was entirely inappropriate. So I can promise you this. If you elect me attorney general, I will ensure that you have the opportunity to govern yourself the way that you see fit. Thank you very much. Next, we have a question for our lieutenant governor candidates. Uh, each of you, like we said, will get uh, 90 seconds to respond. And if I forgot to mention to the candidates, if anybody mentions you directly by name, I will give you 30 seconds to respond to the uh, your, your fellow candidate who called you up. 
uh, or the lieutenant governor candidates. While millennials are the most educated generation, they are also the most unemployed, underpaid, and indebted generation. Nearly half of millennial graduates are unable to find jobs in their field of study, suggesting that they are prepared for a job market that doesn't exist. What steps can Virginia take to bridge the gap between higher education and workforce development? We'll go ahead and start with you, Mr. Davis. Sure. Well, first, thank you for having us, Matt Pack. I really appreciate everything you and your team did to have us today. It's simple. Um, yeah, there's been some employment problems. Yes, there's some debt problems, but you didn't cause them. We did. You didn't cause the crisis that we've got right now with our budgets where tuition's so high. You didn't let those tuitions continue to rise. You didn't cause the economic crisis that cut jobs that you're getting ready to leave universities and not have the same economic opportunities that I had when I left George Mason. And that's what we got to fix for you. So what do we need to do? Well, there's a couple of things. You see, I was Bob McDonald's aide in the mid-90s when George Allen was governor. I remember George Allen uh, freezing tuition costs, and I think it's about time we do it again. That set the tempo, that set the stage, and that allowed people to go in and get the, uh, the higher education they needed to succeed. But the second thing we need to do is not just about costs. You see, you have to go and be able to afford the cost of education, but part of that is not just keeping the cost low, but also making sure you can make the money on the back side, which means that we have an education system that helps you be the best prepared you can be in a 21st century global economy. And that's bringing in higher education, make sure they're teaching the skill sets you need, not, not hypothetical skill sets, but real skill sets, coding, 21st century skill sets that are going to allow us to lead again for manufacturing, for high-tech jobs, and allow you to go in and not have a whole bunch of debt, and when you come out, be able to pay whatever debt you may have and have the best economic opportunity for you and your family in the future. Let me, uh, let me first say, I know we were supposed to take 30 seconds to introduce ourselves, but I'll just get right into the question. That's a, that's a tough question for me because I'm the second kid in my family ever to get a college degree. My brother being the first, a couple years older than me. So, no one in my family ever had a degree going all the way back. So, education in and of itself, my mom used to say this. She used to say that education is not only for earning a living, which is what the millennials are facing now, and I have one, and she's a first year right here on the, the campus of the University of Virginia. But it's not only for earning a living, but it's for really learning to live, to serve, and to lead. Think about that for a second. How do we make a living? How do we serve and how do we lead going forward? We have inherited this debt from the generation in front of us and we've done nothing to solve that. Government hasn't been, uh, been the solution, they've been the problem to why we have so much debt and why it's so hard for millennials to get out and get a job. We've got to match those skill sets up with the jobs of the 21st century. We've worked very, very hard in the last five years to help our veterans, which is something I'm, I'm a veteran. Uh, have served as an Army Ranger, uh, law enforcement, and the such. We're, we've got to match that skill set with the demand that's out there. And the way you do that is you've got to have the right policies. In order to get the right policies, you've got to get bills passed. So we've got to have somebody that understands and sets a vision for the Commonwealth to make that priority one. We're going to do that as the next Lieutenant Governor. Thank you so much. All right. Moving on to our gubernatorial uh, candidates, uh, the uh, first question is, like most states, Virginia has significantly reduced higher education funding over the past decade. According to the American Council on Education, Virginia cut funding for higher education 53.6% from 1980 and 2011, between 1980 and 2011. As a result, tuition has risen drastically, shifting the financial burden onto Virginia students and their families. Meanwhile, Virginia's four-year institutions have actually increased operational spending, primarily on non-academic expenses. As governor, how would you alleviate Virginia students and their families from the skyrocketing costs of higher education? We'll go ahead and start uh, at the end there uh, with uh, Mr. Stewart. Not quite yet. Not quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wagner here. Anyway, uh, uh, thanks for having me. I want to thank Backpack, and I want to thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Whitbeck, uh, for allowing us to be in front of you today. And before I begin, I did want to introduce uh, my wife of uh, 22 years, Maria. She's in the back, right back there. I want to thank Governor Gilmore, what a great Republican leader, and Governor Gilmore, we're lucky to have him here in the Commonwealth of Virginia.
the University of Virginia, William and Mary, Virginia Tech. We got a lot of great universities in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And guess what? They were built by you. They were built by you, not by the university professors, not by the university presidents, not by the deans and the provosts. They were built by you for Virginians. I think it's absolutely shameful that not just the cost of education has gone up, but what we are teaching our children in universities in the Commonwealth of Virginia is doing them very, very little good. How many of you out there know a university student, a recent graduate, who recently is now unemployed? A lot of you. I know this is true. And that is why we need to uh, rectify the situation, and we need to make sure that we're providing for good education and providing more certifications and less of the politically correct madness that is going on today. Senator Wagner. Thank you, John, and thank you for all getting up on your Saturday, and it's a beautiful Saturday out there to be here with us and, and hear about the issues. Let me just say this about college costs. First of all, we don't own the colleges, the governor doesn't own the colleges, the, the president of the universities, the board of visitors, they don't own the colleges. Each person in this room, each citizen of Virginia owns our colleges and universities, and they should have first priority to attendance at our colleges and universities. Let me tell you another thing, and everybody shudders, but I've been around in the General Assembly a long time. Under Governor Allen, we capped tuitions. We capped tuitions, we actually lowered tuitions a year later. And you know what? The universities didn't fall off the ramp. The universities didn't fall into, in, into oblivion. In fact, they still maintain their national ratings all over. It's amazing what you can do when you realize that's all you have to do it with. You as a family have to do that every day. You have to live within your budget. You have to live within your budget, within your companies. You have to live within a budget, every, everything. Once you have a fixed cap tuition, I can guarantee you that the universities can live within their budget. Now, I hear this raising of tuitions, and I also see at the same time, here at University of Virginia, they've amassed a $2.2 billion surplus that's in, a, it's in a fund right now, gathering interest. That's the kind of, if you will, profits that some of these universities are making. That should go back to reducing tuitions and bringing back in the levels. I'm confident if you can amass that kind of fortune, you can afford to cap tuition. So thank you all very much. Mr. Riggleman? Uh, believe it or not, I was a millennial once, long ago. Uh, I barely remember. And I apologize that I can't stand up. I want to thank Ed in advance, because I think he's going to sit with me while he talks. But uh, um, yeah, I wrestle gorillas for a living, and I got hurt yesterday, and I apologize again for that, too. So um, as far as the fact that I said I'm a millennial once, here's the thing. I think the governor, governor has a lot of power to project over four years during their term how much the schools actually spend. When you're in business, like a lot of people up here, you look at those four-year projections, and I don't see why we can't actually talk about construction costs and non-educational costs in a, in, a, in a way that we flatline those costs projections over the next four years to make sure tuition stays down. I think when you do anything, for me, I was taught a long time ago that you take three months when you get somewhere, if you're in charge, and you try to see what the lay of the land is. I think when we talk about education, the fact is I was the first to go to college ever in my family. I think when you talk about education, why in the heck can we work with the universities on a four-year basis rather than just year by year? That's just something that I've done my whole life. If you do a business plan, it's usually a three to five year business plan. So once you look at those projections and look at the cost, we tell students, listen, you don't have to go to a Taj Mahal to actually have an education. I did get sent to the University of Virginia. But I tell you what, I think a lot of us up here had parents who had an education in a lot, a lot less sort of economic advantageous areas than the Taj Mahal of all things to do college. So that's what I think we do. We project, we look at our performance, and we go ahead and we cut construction costs and make sure that we just have education-based planning going forward. Thank you. Mr. Gillespie. I am going to sit in solidarity with my opponent, Denver Riggleman, here today, who's playing in pain. Uh, uh, look, thank you to Backpack and for NextGen for hosting this. This is a very important question. I, like many others here, first generation to ever attend college. Neither of my parents went to college. And I'm fortunate to have had that opportunity. That opportunity is getting harder and harder for too many hardworking Virginia families. Constant stream of tuition hikes and fee increases are putting college out of reach. And we have got to get to control. Many of our colleges over the past decade have doubled the cost of fees and tuition, or in some, in one case, tripled. 
and we've got to make sure that we are uh, making college more affordable. The average student debt for a student coming out of a Virginia graduating from a Virginia college today is thirty-six thousand dollars, and it's making it too hard for the millennial generation to be able to get out on their own, buy a car, get an apartment, start a new business, and so we've got to get control of that. Now, the governor has a lot to do about that and say to, to that because the governor of the Commonwealth appoints every member of the boards of visitors of every one of our public colleges and universities. And when I'm governor, I will make sure that every one of those visitors understands their sole mission is to answer to the needs of the students and the parents and the taxpayers and hold down costs, not respond to the interests and the needs of the faculties and the administrations. We do that, we can hold down costs and also uh, get more participation in dual enrollment programs and our community college transfers. We can make college more affordable for hardworking Virginia families. Going back to the Attorney General race, uh, Mr. Adams, the next question is this. Millennials maintain a higher distrust of politicians and the system than older generations did at the same age. Given the national rhetoric of improper influence and ethical challenges in politics, and given Virginia's recent history with, with those issues, what will, you do, what will you do as Virginia's Attorney General to reduce millennial skepticism and keep politics clean? Thanks, John. Um, first of all, um, about me, uh, I have never run for any office. I've never sought any office before. So I've spent my life in public service. This isn't a stepping stone for me. I did this because of the way Mark Herring has treated that office. So my life uh, has been spent in, in private practice as a lawyer and in public service as a lawyer, whether it was uh, at the Supreme Court for Clarence Thomas or in the White House uh, for President Bush or in the U.S. Attorney's Office offices of federal prosecutor. So when I'm the attorney general, here's what I know. I'm not going to do anything, anything, for something that is to put my interest above yours. Because I have no interest in a long-term political career. I have an interest in getting control of the attorney general's office so that it will be responsive to the citizens of the Commonwealth of Virginia. A lot of people, how many of you have a funny lawyer joke you like to tell? Everybody loves to bash lawyers. I will tell you, I, they do, come on. I will tell you right now, I am proud to be a lawyer. I am proud to be a Virginia lawyer. And when you're a Virginia lawyer, your conduct is governed by multiple ethical rules, including specific ones for the Attorney General and, and lawyers in public office. And I can promise you this, when I am your Attorney General, I will never embarrass you, and I will always put the interest of the Commonwealth of Virginia above my own. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Chuck Smith. Welcome, Chuck. Can you repeat the question? I'd be happy to. Yes, wonderful. Mr. Smith. Good evening. <laughs> Good afternoon, thank you. <laughs> John. Millennials maintain a higher distrust of politicians and the system that older generations did at the same age. Given the national rhetoric of improper influence and ethical challenges in politics, along with Virginia's recent history with the issues, what will you do as Attorney General to reduce our, the millennial skepticism and keep politics clean? First of all, good afternoon. Thank you so much for waiting. Thank you so much for being here. It's always wonderful to show up last. Uh, what we need to do in Virginia politics is to keep Virginia politics honest. We need to get back to our values, get back to our principles. For millennials, I say to you, Look at us do the right things instead of the consistently wrong things. Look at us do the things that will make Virginia great. I think we can keep millennials' interest if we keep our system honest, if we keep our system clean, and get away from the good old boy politics of the past and the favoritism. Let's base our system on qualification, because at the end of the day, that's where millennials are coming from. They're coming up from the grassroots, they're coming up from our neighborhoods, and they're looking for us to make the proper and correct choices. Thank you. All right, going back to our 10th governor candidates. Next question is, in 2014, more people in Virginia died of op opioid overdoses than car accidents. And this past November, Governor McAuliffe declared Virginia's opioid addiction crisis a public health emergency. What do you think our state leaders must do in order to address the ep ep epidemic of opioid addiction? Start with you, Senator Reed. So, some of you may not know this, but in a previous life, I used to be an undercover narcotics detective. So, this is an issue that hits really close to home for me. 
In fact, this year uh, in the Senate, I carried a bill uh, with regard to opioids and trying to curb that. We've got a two-pronged problem here. We've got to address the addiction side, and we also have to address the supplier side. Uh, and there's big money engaged in this. That's, that's the big hard lift that we have to get past to some of the pharmaceutical companies and some of the insurance companies' willingness to bend on some of these things. We've got to stop these docs in a box that just run out all these scripts. So we've got to tighten that up. And the, probably the bigger challenge that we have now is how do we curb and rehab the people that are addicted to these things? That's, that's the biggest challenge because let me tell you something. Heroin is horrible. And it affects every person in every neighborhood regardless of social economic class, race, color, or creed. It's a disease that is sweeping our nation and young people, millennials, are dying in the droves. But it's going to take community engagement as well. And we've got to lift the stereotype off of these things and, and, and kind of keep them at home and nobody wants to know about them. We've got to go after this stuff like we went after polio and all the other diseases. We've got to marshal our forces and put every amount of effort on it or we're going to lose a generation. That's how bad this is. It's horrible. We've got to focus everything we have to stop the opioid crisis. Thank you. Delegate Davis. Well, I've got 40,000 miles on the RV up there in Billy Yellow, and as we've been taking around the state, there isn't one locality that I've been to that hasn't named that as probably the most important issue that we're facing the Commonwealth of Virginia. Opioid addiction is really impacting all of us, and honestly, we probably all is someone that has been afflicted, is afflicted, someone in the community that, uh, that is having issues today. And that opioid addiction has gone down into the heroin addiction as well. And it's, it's the soccer moms. This is no longer what someone may stereotype the typical user of these types of drugs. But what we have to stop doing is taking Richmond has all the answers. The same thing with education with y'all. You see, we're in Richmond and we all have different backgrounds, but we're not the stakeholders all the time. We're not the guys on the ground 24-7 like the sheriffs and the police officers and the doctors and the hospitals, we're not the ones that see it on the ground floor day in and day out. So if you want to solve a problem, you prioritize the problem. And you prioritize it by inviting the stakeholders around the table and having that committee come together and share their thoughts, share their ideas. And out of that brain trust come some ideas. And then you work hard, you get them implemented, but it doesn't stop there. Because you see, sometimes in Richmond, People I have it saying, we've solved it, we've passed the law, we've passed the bill, we're good, let's move on. But they don't track what really happened afterwards. Do we truly solve, do we truly have the impacts that we expected to have? And if we didn't, let's modify it. I think that's how we need to track, uh, attack this issue as well. All right, let's go over to our gubernatorial candidates. The question is, in an era of unprecedented mass incarceration, Millennials are the most incarcerated generation in America. Millennials make up half of America's prison population, and in 2012, 40% of federal drug offenders sentenced to prison were under 30 years old. What measures need to be taken to fix our broken criminal justice system in order to get millennials out from behind bars and back into society as productive and successful members? We'll start this one in reverse order with Mr. Gillespie. You know, when you look at the impact of and this gets ties to the previous question in terms of the uh, opioid heroin addiction. And, uh, you know, we are losing three Virginians a day on average dying from uh, this epidemic of, of uh, heroin abuse and, and uh, opioids. We've got to address it. We need to have education, interdiction, intervention. Uh, and then in terms of the incarceration, you know, it cost, the average cost of incarceration per person in our Virginia jails, prisons is $29,000 per year per inmate. And if we could make sure that we can get folks intervened in time so for them to have education, uh, to have interdiction, to crack down on dealers, keep them out of the jails, obviously, you know, that would save us a lot of money, but it would also save a lot of lives, which is important. We've also got to help those who have served their time re-enter our society. I believe in redemption and reconciliation. And one of the problems that we have is when people come out of jails, I was in Chesterfield Jail, a couple months ago, I met with 45 inmates who were incarcerated there, millennials, most of them, dealing with their heroin addiction in the heroin addiction recovery program. And one of the things you'll hear from them is when we come out, we cannot find work, we can't get a job, we relapse, and then we end up engaged in recidivism to uh, support our addiction. 
we've got to have some reforms here that make it easier for people when they come out of jails, if they've completed a program of recovery, to be encourage employers to, to hire them. We can mitigate the risk to employers and cover costs for that, but it would save us money when you're looking at $29,000 a year per inmate. Mr. Ringelman. <laughs> So I'm allowed to share this story. It's a personal story. I'm going to ask my brother about it. So my brother was incarcerated uh, for marijuana, uh, intended to distribute, got nine months in jail. Um, got 10 years, but they suspended most of them and gave him five years of probation. When I asked him about trying to get into the workforce, he said a couple of things. He said, number one, you know, I was paying for my own jail time and for the fact that I had child support while I was in jail based on a marijuana conviction. By the way, just two weeks ago, he had his rights given back to him to vote after 10 years. When we look at this type of thing going on and you look at, um, if it is the millennial population, drugs, I think sometimes are linked to jobs. I think it's linked to this, some of the policies that we make as a governor, as a legislature, to make sure that we're doing the right things so that millennials know that they have a support structure out there, not only with a fair playing field, but if they do screw up, like my brother did, that they're going to get help transitioning back into the community. This isn't a long answer for me. All I know is that from my personal experience, we have to somehow not only educate, we have to help them integrate back into society on some kind of financial level. You probably shouldn't be charging inmates for jail time. You probably shouldn't be doing some of those things. That's why I'm so passionate about this, this subject. When you have family members that have been through it, and some of you might have out there, you sort of understand that trying to transition back into society is so daggone difficult. So when I'm governor, I think we have to look at education, but also helping them to fight financially transition back into our environment. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Uh, thank you all for the question, and, and let me just say this, that uh, uh, I think when you look at millennials, you need to separate the type of crime, whether it's violent or nonviolent. If it's a violent crime, incarceration is altogether the appropriate position for people who commit violent crimes. Now, we put into place here in Virginia, and we need to expand it. I guess it comes with the experience of knowing what's going on in Richmond. Drug courts, and drug courts have proved themselves to be very effective in those localities where we've instituted it. And what a drug court is, it is recognized that an addict, in order to support their habit, committed a crime. And it gives them an opportunity to actually seek treatment and have that reduced sentence perhaps even expunged from their records. And that's the appropriate, appropriate, in my mind, way to go. To give that opportunity, understanding they have an addiction, it's the addiction that drove them to the crime to pay for the addiction. And let's get them into a treatment program rather than to prosecute these people, make them criminals for the rest of their lives, can't find the jobs, can't do many of the things we're talking. It's a program that's proved itself working. It's one of those programs that needs to be expanded in Virginia. Now, violent felons, that's the appropriate place for violent felons. And to tell you the truth, I have very little use for them. Um, the drug court's been very, very good. And uh, it's experience in Richmond, I think, to know that. And one more thing that, that comes, and it was a comment I heard earlier, we do have programs that provide tax credits to employees if they seek employment who are already felons. I know in my shipyard I've used those programs to give people a second chance to work and get back to work again. Well, this is something that I, first of all, I want to say to Denver, I don't think that his brother should have been jailed in the first place. Uh, we need to be focusing on the real crimes, the real problems that we have, but I think it's absolutely atrocious that we're jailing people simply because they're in possession of marijuana. That's got to end, and I am all for decrypt, decriminalizing marijuana in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Right. I'm not talking about legalizing it, because I don't think it's good, but I think we need to be focusing our resources on the real crimes and the real problems. Every day in the Commonwealth of Virginia, 24 people are hospitalized for overdoses. And by the way, the prisons and our jails are the wrong places to be treating mental illness. It is absolutely shameful. It is absolutely shameful that we don't have a system in the Commonwealth, a system, a mental health system inside of our jail system. We need mental health courts, not just in Norfolk. We've got one of those courts. We need them all across because it's the wrong thing to do. Not only is it wrong for the person who is jailed, but it's wrong for the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's wrong for the taxpayers that we're jailing people who can't get medication, who sit, their only crime has been, frankly, that they can't get the, the treatment that they need in order to cover themselves and become productive citizens. Right, a final question for our Attorney General candidates. 
If you get the nomination for Attorney General, what is the primary issue you believe will make you a more attractive candidate to young voters over Mark Herring? And Mr. Smith, we'll go ahead and start with you. Well, first of all, I think that uh, any issue would make me a more attractive voter. <laughs> I will say that getting us back to our Constitution, uh, just listening to the other candidates talk about the incarceration of millennials, you know, millennials are people too. But what I think will make me a more attractive Attorney General is making sure that our system is fair. As I travel around Virginia, I, I talk to a lot of people. I talk to millennials, I talk to old, older people. Uh, uh, the message I'm getting is they believe our system is corrupt. They believe that the people uh, who are enforcing the law those who are applying the law can do a better job. As Attorney General, I want to make sure the Constitution, number one, is being enforced, that our courts are enforcing the Constitution, that our system is fair from the ground up. I want to make sure that the people who go through our system, they come out with a sense uh, uh, that they have had their day in court or they, they've had justice given to them. I do feel, like Frank Wagner, that the security of Virginians is first and foremost. We can never overlook that. We want to make sure that people who are released uh, uh, and they're turned over the streets of Virginia are not affecting adversely uh, the citizens that we have. But I think the more attractive Attorney General candidate is going to be to, do, to undo many of the things that uh, Mark Herring has done. We cannot continue a policy where we don't have faith in our own laws. We cannot continue a policy where our Constitution is on the back door rather than the front door. Thank you. It's uh, what I do during the day when I'm not running for office. Uh, I help run one of the largest law firms in the country. It's based right here in Virginia, McGuire Woods. I was a hiring partner for three years. I have hired dozens and dozens and dozens of millennial lawyers. I have in my department that I run 63 now lawyers. Probably 20 of them are millennials, and I know this about millennials. It's not the old days where you grab a young associate and say, this is the brief I want, these are the way, this is the way I want it written, these are the issues we're gonna, we're gonna address. Millennials wanna be a part of, the, of a step before that. They wanna be in the room talking about the strategy. They don't wanna be told what to do, they wanna be a part of the process. It's actually intellectually invigorating to be with a young lawyer who's just coming out of law school because they don't wanna just carry out orders, they wanna be a part of the decisional process of the strategy. So you tell me, if that's the way millennials think, if they want to be a part of the process, how in the world can they tolerate an attorney general who ignores the laws that the citizens pass? Right? How in the world can they accept the fact to be told by a big monolithic government, and even worse, an attorney general who ignores the laws passed by the government, this is the way it's going to be? They want to have their voice heard, and you can't have your voice heard if your attorney general ignores the laws you pass. Thank you. question is, in recent years, millennials have gravitated towards cities and more urban lifestyles. Considering that millennials will make up 50% of the workforce by 2020, how can Virginia approach economic development in order to make all areas of Virginia more appealing to a younger workforce? Delegate Davis. Well, we create the economic opportunity. I mean, it really is simple. But the hard part is we can't just keep talking about it. There comes a time we have to do it. You know, our party has always been a party of solutions ever since I knew our party. I was blessed to be born in 1970, which means the first president I knew was Ronald Reagan. And I saw the Berlin Wall come down with a fire and a shot. I saw an economy go from waiting in lines at the gas station to one of economic prosperity. But most of you here never saw that. You never experienced it. You don't know what our party can do. And right now, we're all a lot of talk. You know, there's a reason why I went to Estonia to see if I could find solutions for coal in southwest Virginia. There's a reason why I went to MIT to see if we can find innovative solutions for technology to bring back to Virginia. You see, if we want to make sure this is a place where students not only are raised, but also go to school and also come back to be with their family after, after they graduate and raise their own family, we have to provide that economic opportunity. And that's our job right now, to make sure that those jobs exist. And not by taking a job from North Carolina and bringing it here with incentives, where we know that they're going to leave after those incentives run out, but by bringing innovation here, where we can capitalize on it, where it becomes native to Virginia, and drives other companies to be here so we can all live here, work here, play here, but most importantly, raise our next families here. Well, 
to address the issue of millennials moving into the cities, uh, I would just tell you that economic development is huge, especially in our cities and revitalizing those cities. And really the reality is this, uh, and I'm going to speak about all of them, but I don't think they all need 30 seconds. We're, we might be the next leaders for right now, but you all are the next leaders for the next generation. And what the best thing I can do as your lieutenant governor is get government out of your way, get those restrictions out to allow you the development uh, and freedom that you need to create that uh, opportunities for the generation that comes after you. Because I have a 13-year-old too, and you all are going to be old people for them. <laughs> right? But here's the thing. I'll leave you guys with this. And I firmly believe with all my heart. And one of the greatest presidents in my lifetime was Ronald Reagan as well. And I got to vote for him the very first time when I turned 18. He said this, that we have the opportunity to stand for something in this country. For freedom, for fairness, and for liberty. Liberty. And that these are the things we're fighting for and we're devoting our very lives to. That's what I've been doing the majority of my adult life, is working to secure and protect not only this nation, in this commonwealth, but that of you all and your families. I've served in the armed forces, I've served as a police officer, and I serve as your senator now. I want to serve as your next lieutenant governor because you're not going to find anybody that's going to outwork us and work any harder. Thank you. All right, our final question for our gubernatorial candidates. For the unaffordable CARE Act to succeed, the Obama administration needed young, healthy millennials to subsidize their substandard health care system, but they didn't take the bait. As Obamacare led to rising health premiums, not even the individual mandate enticed millennials, as paying the IRS penalty was more affordable than actually buying insurance. While being able to remain on their parents' health care plans until age 26 helped, the relief was short-lived. After congressional leadership made, made good on their promise, makes good on their promise to repeal and replace Obamacare, what role should the Commonwealth take in increasing access to affordable quality health care for all Virginians? We'll start with Mr. Riggleman. Thank you. Um, being the last question, based on this, I don't know if you guys know this, we actually tried to get into Obamacare as a business um, probably about a year ago. Um, and the premiums were so ridiculous, we went over to a private um, holder. So I think, I think what you're seeing as far as millennials, I think they saw the shell game that was being used to have higher rates for them to support people who maybe weren't as good as health, maybe like old people like me. So I think that's what was going on. Um, as far as changing something, it's something we've been studying, but I wonder this. I wonder if Virginia can have some type of supplemental insurance that, that goes along with people to a certain age also. It would be hard to fund. Um, I've seen some other trying to do it for veterans as far as funding it from the state level. But if we have a real policy and we study it, how can Virginia specifically, without federal inter interference, support millennials with their insurance issues, and how do we balance that out? I think that's a question, I think this is the toughest question of the entire uh, forum that we have right now. Um, how do we use Virginia, and how do we use Virginia state funds responsibly to support any type of retroactive thing on ACA, which I never agreed with to begin with, but how do we make sure that, that works? I think that's something we have to look into. I don't have a specific answer for it, I'm pretty honest about it, because we have tried this in the personal business level so many times to find cheaper insurance for our employees and that's why we had tried the ACA and it failed miserably. So right now, when I'm looking at this audience, looking at what we do with our own employees, at some point, how does Virginia support that type of insurance and that type of support for millennials? Thanks. Okay, and Chairman Stewart. Is there a closing statement after this? Uh, yes, we will. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is just the quote. We're still in the question and answer. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, well, first of all, how many of you work? How many of you work? All right. How many of you are millennials? And how many of you are paying, because you're working, you're paying uh, payroll taxes, including Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security? And how many of you think, how many of you think that you're actually going to be able to benefit from those programs when you come of age? Not a single hand goes up. We are ripping off this generation right now. You are subsidizing. What's going on now, and when, by the time you come of age and you're making lots of money, there's not going to be a lot left. And when you retire, there will be nothing left. We've got to take this on head on. And the only way we're going to be able to do this, and by the way, the Commonwealth of Virginia, in 1985, we were spending 5% of the state's budget on Medicaid. And today, that is 22%.
We've got to control it if we want any money left for any other state program. The only way we're going to do that is to block grant Medicaid, work with the Trump administration, which I intend to do, and cap Medicaid spending at 20% of the state's budget and make sure we're leaving room for all the other states' programming, especially education and transportation. Mr. Gillespie. Well, obviously, this is heavily affected by federal policy, and I am looking forward to the Republican Congress and President Trump repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act and, and giving us a chance, particularly when it comes to Medicaid, when they can block grant it to the states, let us innovate. We'll be able to save money for our taxpayers and we'll be much more innovative with those programs. But there are things we can do at the state level to make health care more affordable. And that includes, for example, allowing us to, uh, to have insurance sold across state lines. When Governor Matt Bevin was in from Kentucky campaigning with me uh, just recently in, in uh, Lynchburg and, and the Valley, you know, we talked about this. And, the fact is, let the states innovate, let us have our insurers compete in Kentucky, let Kentucky insurers compete here, and that will be good for consumers. We need to allow for small businesses to risk pool so that they can get the benefit, uh, even small employers can get the benefit of uh, group rates. And we also need to allow for reforms of our certificate of public need policies here in the Commonwealth and for uh, direct uh, provider insurance coverage for, uh, for businesses as well. There's a number of reforms that would help us bring down the cost of health care. I want to touch real quickly with a little bit of time I had left on the previous question, because I think it's a very important one. And one of the things we need to do for some of those rural communities and some of the communities that are struggling economically is get not just infrastructure in terms of roads and highways, but broadband and cell phone towers to create opportunities. And I see my friend Saul Fernandez here, and uh, he is someone who is, uh, Saul Fernandez, leading the uh, charge in, in uh, southwest Virginia on this, and he and I are working together on some policies in these regards, and appreciate his leadership at the local level as a supervisor. We need more of it. So thank you. Senator Langer. Thank you. And uh, as Nancy Pelosi says, you, you got to pass it to find out what's in it. And uh, I, think, I think all of us experienced what was in the Affordable Care Act. It was the Unaffordable Care Act. And it's caused problems and, and throughout, and quite frankly, I think, led to the demise of the Democrat Party in this most previous election. We touched on a number of things, but some of the innovative programs we're looking at, we very, very much are looking forward to the opportunity to have them block grant Medicaid to the state. We know we can do it better in Virginia. We know we can do it with a lot less paperwork. And when you delve into the health care issues like I have for the past 20 years in the General Assembly, you will find out that a large amount of your health care dollar that you pay today goes to paperwork, goes to, goes to people that don't practice medicine at all, but check on other people to check on the bills to do those kinds of things. This is an opportunity, if Washington really takes the shackles off of Virginia, to streamline the system to make sure that your health care dollar goes to your health care and not to a bunch of intermediaries who drive the cost of health care up and up and up. Also, I think we need to look at innovative programs that we see going on now. The Purdue Shipbuilding has basically put their own clinic into place and just has an insurance policy for the very, very expensive things. That's an opportunity. It's worked very, very well. Save money, better health care. We can expand that, make that available to small businesses, make that available to individuals and communities, have that same kind of concept where you cut out all the middlemen, you cut out all the overhead, and that health care dollar goes to exactly what you need it to do, and that's your own health care. Well, now I'm going to time for closing statements. As you may have, as Senator Reeves noticed, I did cut the 30-second opening because we were way behind. Uh, and we need to be done by 4.30 for all your schedule. But we would, we did not have anybody break the 11th commandment, so we did have a 30 second uh, ad, so you have some time. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Uh, so if everybody doesn't object, we'll give everybody a minute uh, closing statement. Does that work? Excellent, okay. The order of the closing statements was uh, selected at random before this began, and we'll start with Mr. Smith. This is my message to millennials and to everyone here. Never before in the history of the United States has the Constitution been more at risk. Never before in the history of the Commonwealth of Virginia have the rights of man, the rights of Virginians, been more at stake. If experience matters, if it ever matters, it matters now. We do not need more laws. We need to enforce the Constitution and the laws that we've got. We don't need more 
Muslims or mosques or refugee resettlements until we protect the citizens we got. We do not need, we don't need more grown men and boys trying to use what's clearly marked as a girl's bathroom, and we definitely do not need more unidentified radical Muslim terrorists running around our country or our commonwealth. We need to get our constitution back in it. We will find the promise of Dr. Martin Luther King and also the promise of Abraham Lincoln. Thank you all. God bless you. <laughs> Who wants to beat Mark Herring in November? <laughs> didn't get in this to lose, okay? So here's what's going on. I'm working hard to earn your nomination. I'm going to work hard to earn your nomination. I have an excellent opponent in Mr. Smith, but I'm working hard to earn your nomination, but I've told my team we're taking the fight to Mark Herring already. Because ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you an interesting fact. No incumbent attorney general in the history of Virginia has been defeated. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to start running against him right now. We already started a couple weeks ago. And when we win, we're not just going to win the Attorney General's office, we're going to make Virginia history. I'm going to need your help to do it. God bless each and every one of you for coming out. Sign up with us afterwards. We're going to need the energy and the excitement of the millennials to do it. God bless every one of you. Thank you. Well, first I want to thank everyone for having us here. I really appreciate it, and this is an amazing, amazing forum. Um, but I want to spend this time making sure that you understand, that some of us do understand what the needs are of, of the millennials, and, and, and we get it. You see, I, I was at the CR convention, and I used to be a CR. I started out as a George Mason CR a long, long time ago. And Ben Desart had it right. He said, you know, we're not the next generation of leaders. We're not the leaders of the next generation. We're leaders today, period. End of story. Nadia, she's not the leader of the next generation. She's a leader in this party. Stacy, not a leader of the next generation. She's a leader today. As are all of you, and I'll tell you, when I came here, I didn't come here just to speak to you, I appreciate the opportunity, but I came here to listen to you. And you put a millennial panel up here. You had Emily, you had Beck, you had Benny, you had so many people up here. And I sat back there to listen because I don't know how to, how to make sure we provide for what you want as you continue in your careers and family without listening. But I was surprised that I couldn't find so many other people that are current stage and others that weren't sitting there with me. So before you listen to us, demand that we sit down there and listen to you as well. I've had a, a lot of great jobs in my short life, I guess. And all these jobs I've ever done have been uh, public service for the most part, but not the easiest of public service. You know, people shooting at you, calling you all kinds of names, spitting on you, doing all kinds of things. So politics is really pretty easy compared to that. <laughs> Let me tell you what the problem is. It's with the heart. The problem with the heart of this country is that we've forgotten who we are. Who we are as a country, who we are as a commonwealth, and what we stand for as Americans. We've gotten out of the business of taking care of people as a Republican Party, and we've allowed the Democrats to own that issue, and they fill that void with government. And here's the challenge. Government doesn't love people. People love people. We've got to get back to the people business We've got to start taking care of the least, the last, and the lost among us. When we turn our attention to the people and serve those that need it the most, then we take care of our fellow Virginians. Thank you so much. God bless you. Chairman Stewart. today than I did a week ago on Saturday when I was over there by the, just a block away at the Robert E. Lee statue getting mobbed by all kinds of lunatic lefties. And because they're trying to rip down our history, folks. They're trying to rip it down and they're trying to defeat us culturally and this is not going to stand in a Stewart administration. We're going to defend our heroes and Robert E. Lee is a hero not just in Virginia, he's an American hero. Now, on Tuesday, on Tuesday, I will be leading a protest outside City Hall here in Charlottesville to get to two things. One is to preserve that statue, a symbol of our history, and secondly, to remove the bigot and the racist who is Wes Bellamy. That man's got to go. Others talk, I do 
better. Others talk about illegal immigration. I've done it. I've deported 7,500 illegal aliens. Others talk about cutting the budget. I've done it. $285 million of spending cuts. Others talk about decreasing taxes. I've done it. The biggest tax cut in Prince William County history. That's what I'm going to do for you. I've lost a couple battles in the last time, but I've never backed down and I never will as your governor. <laughs> Let me thank Mac Pack for hosting this event, first of all, and let me thank you all for coming out here. You know, I grew up in Virginia, and I, I went to the Naval Academy, uh, served as a hard hat diver in the Navy. But one of the things we learned at the Naval Academy is a ship that goes to sea and doesn't know where it's headed is bound to drift aimlessly in the ocean. So ladies and gentlemen, I think it's imperative that you're going, and I have that plan, a vision where all parts of Virginia are hitting on all eight cylinders. All parts of Virginia are producing. For too long, we've been treating symptoms in Richmond, symptoms of a bad economy, and not treating the economy. And if we talked about it a little bit, we talked about infrastructure that has to be put into place, both transportation and broadband. I spent the better part of this last session fighting back an attempt to limit broadband expansion. And, and we were successful in, in reducing that bill down to, to next to nothing. We need to look at our transportation network, and we have plenty of jobs available today in Virginia. I have six daughters that are all millennials. They manage to find jobs, every one of them, maybe not in the field they're working at, but we need to look at our plenty of jobs out there, look at the education system, ensure that we have people trained to fill those jobs, and then we need to get government out of the way and let business do what business does best. So thank you all very, very much. You know, we've talked about the Virginia way. Um, my wife is sitting over here, Christine. She's related to Robert E. Lee. So we certainly have some things that uh, we agree on with everybody up here. My question to everybody there is how, do we, how, do we, how are we transformative? How are we disruptive in a positive way? The Virginia way doesn't like bullies. The Virginia way is about liberty and it's about freedom. We have been bullied. I think a lot of you out there also by government. That is why I'm up here running today. I think that right now, if we continue this peaceful revolution, something that's happened, that we see going on right now, we can win this. We can win this. But again, everybody up here is better than the two alternatives we have running against us today. So I'm going to tell you right now, everybody has to work at your level. Everybody has to work at the local levels to fight. Be disruptive. Be transformative. And let's get Republicans back into the governor's mansion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all, and very apt for the time we, you may notice we all got a trophy, but I don't know if anybody else, mine, mine says first place, which I appreciate. <laughs> thank you all for making time today to talk about the issues we face as a commonwealth, and they are serious, and we have to address these challenges now. The fact is that we are in the bottom 10 of states when it comes to economic growth, Virginia. We had more people move out of the commonwealth than into it for three straight years in a row because of a lack of opportunity. And that correlates with the fact that we, just five years ago, were number one on the list of CNBC best states to do business list. And now we're not even in the top 10. We have dropped from number 12 to number 13 most recently. We have to turn that around. And that means we've got to stop the liberal governance in the governor's mansion. We cannot have Ralph Northam or Tom Perriello continue the McAuliffe failed policies. We need to cut taxes. We need to repeal antiquated regulations. We need to reform our education system to meet the needs of the workforce of today and the future. And I will put forward a sweeping plan to do that and get Virginia moving again. When it comes to economic growth, we should be first in the nation, and we can be. And Kathy and I, are, we're all in. We've been, we'll be married 30 years in May, and we are all in this race. We are going to win it. I'll need a unified ticket to victory in the governor's office, lieutenant governor, and attorney general. Thank you all so much. God bless you. God bless the Commonwealth of Virginia. God bless the United States of America. Uh, the outstanding gentleman on the stage conducted yourself with class, uh, dignity. I really appreciate that as the chairman of the party. Whichever one of y'all is the nom. <laughs> <laughs> right. Whichever one of you is the nominee, as long as it's not Bryce, we will be with you 100%, 110%. We will work our, our, our tails off for you. And everybody in this audience, are you going to work for these candidates?
all so much on behalf of Magna for being here. And just to say something real quick about the trophies. Something that um, older generations have kind of granted to millennials is that it doesn't matter if you win or lose first or last place. It's all that matters is just show it up. That's why I had you saw me running on stage and hand them before they even began, because it didn't even matter how they did. They, they showed up. I thought he put fun of our stereotype a little bit. All right, guys. The last event today is actually not in this building. It's going to be over at Random Road Brewery.